Good afternoon. We're about a week into August and typically this is the time of the year that we start to see uh, things kind of get a little more active out in the Atlantic Basin. But first, let's talk about the breeding grounds that we typically watch for development to occur in in the month of August, and that's going to be the Gulf of Mexico. As we slide south into the Caribbean Sea, we see more development there with ocean waters getting super warm like we'll talk about in just a second and also into the uh, parts of the Atlantic Ocean and also into the far uh, let's say western parts of the main development region. We'll talk about exactly what that means in just a second though out there on satellite imagery of the tropical Atlantic ghost town. Nothing going on out there once again. And there's a lot of factors as to why this looks like this dry air out there, which we'll talk about in a second. But we also have a lack of really potent African easterly waves. We've had a few that come off the coast looking really robust and then they hit this dry air and relatively cooler ocean temperatures and they typically fall apart. You can see we got another one coming our way heading towards the coast of Africa in the next couple of days or so. Now what you're looking at here is water vapor imagery. This is a filter we put on the satellite and this depicts dry air and moist air. The bright colors are the dry air. Lots of it, and that's not a good thing if we're trying to develop tropical systems out here. We need moist air to help these storms get going and kind of maintain as they go through the upper atmosphere and push their way off towards the west. And we're just not seeing that just yet. There's also been a lot of Saharan dust coming off the Sahara Desert and the continent of Africa that's been kind of inhibiting any potential development. So when I talk about the main development region, I'm looking at this area here, and this is typically where we find some of the warmest uh, waters, and this is where the uh, African easterly waves start to develop and over 50% of major hurricanes category three or greater uh, form within this main development region. So we need to pay attention to what's going on here. And right now with the ocean temperatures kind of at or below what we need them to be at, which is 80 degrees Fahrenheit, that has to do with the evaporation and the latent heat release. That is the fuel for storms to develop. I'm not going to get too much into the physics there, but you can see some of the sea surface temperature readings currently. Uh, they are you know, not terribly cold but they are certainly below that 80 degree water temperature that we need. We have some 74, some upper 70s, and then the farther south you get, obviously it'll be a little bit warmer there. Now the anomalies, the departure from normal or the departure from average are quite split between the MDR. We have the cooler than average in the blue and the slightly warmer than average in the yellow. Obviously a little bit warmer off to the south you go. Now remember those breeding grounds I was talking about? Let's switch it up there and talk about those areas, Gulf of Mexico, Caribbean, and parts of the Atlantic. Well, this is the time of year we watch for development here and water temperatures certainly warm enough to support tropical activity. Some of these numbers in the upper 80s, it's almost bath water in these regions and each degree you go above that 80 degree Fahrenheit is insurmountable amounts of moisture that's available for these moisture and energy, I should say, uh, for these storms to use and kind of grow and that can certainly support major hurricane growth there. Also to note is that these warm waters extend to a certain depth. You need the depth in that warm water. If it's just on the surface as a hurricane goes over it and mixes it up, something called upwelling and it eventually peters on out. But when it's at a depth, of several hundred meters and you get that warm water there, there's a lot of energy available there. So notice the anomalies here, a lot of yellows indicating the above average temperatures for this time of the year in that region. Now let's talk about the Pacific. We are on the 10th named storm so far and likely we will see the 11th in the next 12 to 24 hours it looks like with a lot of development going on there. So far there have been three major hurricanes most recently and still existent is Hector that we're going to talk about in a second. But here it is out in the Pacific. Very, very active at uh, the current time. We have John, Ileana and then Christy, which will probably be named in the next uh, 12 to 24 hours. And of course, major hurricane Hector. Let's get a better look at this. This is exhibiting an annular structure. And what I mean by that as you can see, it looks like a pinwheel here. It looks like a buzz saw going on into the uh, west, and that's not really showing any outscale rain bands on this particular storm here. A lot of convection, very symmetrical, and it's very condensed. It's a relatively small system. We're talking about 300 miles of diameter here, so it's not a massive storm, but certainly some very strong winds there. 140 mile per hour winds sustained. It's about less than 900 miles away from the big island in Hawaii. And as we look at it here on the forecast track, it's going to eventually head close to Hawaii, but looks to be a miss. I also want to note here, this line of longitude, 140 degrees west, is uh, 
something to note because it just crossed it and now it's moved into a different jurisdiction. There are different basins. There are seven in terms of the tropics. Uh, one that's controlled by the National Hurricane Center out in Miami, and that goes from the coast of Africa all the way to this line of longitude. Once it crosses that, it goes into the Central Pacific, and that hurricane center is based in Honolulu. So they'll be issuing the advisories on Hector now as it progresses off towards the west. Notice the cone of uncertainty rather small as it slides to the south of the big island of Hawaii, about 160 miles uh, from north to south there. So there is some wiggle room, but again, it is a relatively small storm. So even if it does pass, say, 150 miles to the south, likely hurricane force winds will not impact the big island there. Here's how the models see things. Each line is a different computer model, and all of them, the consensus is taking it to the south of the big island. But again, depending on how far north or south it goes, it could still bring some impacts. Here we're looking at the tropical storm force wind probabilities, and you can see the scale up here. Looks like the big island gets into a around 40, maybe 50% chance of seeing a uh, winds in excess of 40 miles per hour as Hector slides on to the south because it's such a small and compact storm. So that's a good news. The wind field isn't very large. All right, that's the latest on the Pacific and the Atlantic. Anything changes, of course, we'll do another video for you. But if you have any questions, you want to be social, find me on Facebook, meteorologist Tim Pandagis, or on Twitter, 13 Tim Pandagis.